Hey guys, it's Bella and welcome back to another episode of Mystery Monday. Let's just go ahead and get into the case. This case is honestly crazy. It is a roller coaster start to finish. It is so interesting. This case was huge in Mexico and it is the death of Paulette Jabara. So Paulette was from Mexico. She was four years old at the time of her death and she suffered from developmental disabilities because of um, when she was born. She was really, really light. They didn't know if she was going to make it, but she did. And unfortunately, because of that, she did suffer from developmental disabilities and she was unable to talk or walk properly. She did go to like a normal school and stuff like that, but she needed like special help because she really just couldn't do these things on her own. She couldn't string together sentences. She could say like mom, dad, food, um, you know, small words, but she couldn't say sentences and she needed assistance when walking. Before her death, Paulette went on a weekend away with her father Mariko and her seven-year-old sister to Valle de Bravo, I believe it's pronounced, um, just for the weekend. Her mother Lizette was not with them. She was on a weekend away as well, but she was in Los Cabos to meet up with a friend and I don't know if if I said that right, I tried googling how to say it, but I just can't get the grasp of it. It was later found though that Lizette was not actually having a weekend away with her friend. She was having an affair, so she was there to meet up with the person she was having an affair with. She had a weekend of partying and drinking, and both of them, both parties, arrived back home on Sunday the 21st of March in 2010. Paulette arrived home at about 9 p.m., and soon after her mother was putting her to bed, she distinctly remembers giving her a kiss on the forehead before putting her to bed and then leaving the room. So the next morning, the girls' nannies, Erica and Martha, got Paulette's older sister ready for school and then they waited with her until the bus came at around 7 a.m. At 8 a.m., they went to go and get Paulette ready for kindergarten and that is when they discovered that she was missing from her bed. They looked everywhere. They looked in her closets and her bathrooms. They looked under the bed. When they couldn't find her anywhere in her room, they even went to check um, Mariko and Lizetta's bedroom, but she was no Nowhere to be found. When they couldn't find her anywhere, they got really worried. They went and told Paulette's parents, obviously, who kind of seemed unbothered by it, which was kind of strange. Um, they didn't really do anything. They didn't help look, but um, Erica and Martha ended up searching the rest of the apartment building. They searched the elevators. They asked the security guards. They searched literally everywhere in this apartment building. No one had seen her and they couldn't find her anywhere. So the police were called and a forensics team was called who then came to the apartment. Apparently they searched the apartment something like five times in the first day that they came there. Like as they showed up, they searched the apartment like five times. They searched everything everywhere and they could not find Paula anywhere. There were no signs of forced entry. There was no signs of struggle. It just kind of was like she disappeared into thin air. So because no one could find her, and no one knew what happened to her. Paulette's parents turned to the media to get some coverage. They were a well-off family and if a well-off family's daughter goes missing, people are going to take notice. So they turned to the media, they did countless interviews, especially Lizette, her mother, um, did a lot of interviews. Lizette was quoted in an interview saying that Paulette was an angel, she never cried, she never threw tantrums, and she also mentioned that the night that she disappeared that nothing seemed off, the dogs didn't bark, they didn't hear any weird noises. Everything seemed normal. Nothing alerted them to the fact that maybe someone was in their house or someone was taking Paulette. Everything just seemed normal. These interviews basically put Paulette's face everywhere. She was all over the TV. She was on billboards. She was on newspapers. She was in magazines. She was everywhere. Everyone was talking about this case. It was huge. I think a lot of the reason that this case got so big is because, as I said, her parents were quite well off. Lizette was a lawyer. They lived in a luxurious apartment in a safe neighborhood. Like, it was meant to be safe. I have no idea. Like, nobody had any idea how she could have been taken. There was no signs of forced entry. But I feel like most of the reason is they were quite a well-off family. It was also really strange because despite her disappearance, there was never any ransom note or any ransom call um, to try and get money for the kidnapping of that of Paulette basically so this was something that a lot of people talked about everyone thought was really weird as in why would you kidnap a child and not try and get any money from it so on the 27th of March Lizette actually did another interview and she did it in Paulette's room she invited many news crews in to interview her while she was sitting on Paulette's bed and the weird thing about this is on the 31st of March Paulette's body was found wedged 
in the corner of her bed. She was wrapped in her own sheets, she was found at the foot of her own bed, and it's just really strange that there were so many people in there, and there was someone sitting on the bed, and people had actually slept on the bed in the nine days that she was missing. People had slept on her bed, and nobody smelt anything, no one saw her there, the nannies had changed the bed sheets and didn't find her. Like, it is actually crazy to me how there were so many people in there, her mother actually sat on the bed, and nobody smelt it like I feel like a body after that long would emit some type of disgusting smell but just nothing just nobody had any idea the bed had been changed people had slept on the bed and you know people had searched the whole place so extensively but nobody found her in her own bed. Forensic experts say that the body couldn't have been there any more than three days, so they started saying that it had to have been a homicide. They said there is no way that the body could have been hidden there for any more than three days without being noticed, without it smelling, and they just were sure that it was a um, homicide case that they were looking into. But um, by the coroner, the death of Paulette was actually ruled an accident. They say that she died from asphyxiation, that she got stuck there, she was in the covers, it compressed her um, lungs and that she wasn't able to breathe and died that way. To further this theory, the nannies had actually made the beds um, while Paulette was still there, as I mentioned before, but they did reconstructions of this where the nannies, after they had found Paulette's body and they were trying to figure out what had happened and they were investigating into her death, they made, they made reconstructions of the nannies making the beds and it is possible from these reconstructions, from what they found, they think it's possible that they didn't find her even while making the beds. A lot of people though do not believe that this was an accidental death and they definitely think that there was some foul play involved because I mean it's just such a weird case and it's so hard to imagine that she died and no one noticed her for nine days. But if something did happen to her and foul play was involved, then it's really, really, like, it would have been just so hard to figure out who did it because hundreds of people had come into the apartment, there was footprints everywhere, fingerprints everywhere, DNA everywhere, people had just come in and out, um, you know, the, the house wasn't a crime scene and it was just so incredibly contaminated that it would have been so hard to figure out who had done it from just the crime scene alone. So that is pretty much all of the evidence and now I'm going to go ahead and get into some theories and the first theory is that Lizette actually killed her own daughter because she had disabilities and it was just too much for her to handle. Lizette was described as intelligent and capable but she was also described as cold, lacking empathy and without emotional attachment. After Paulette's disappearance she was actually, and I cannot even believe this, quoted saying even if I lose Paulette I have another daughter. That just blows my mind. She didn't show any signs of grieving, which is why a lot of people think that she is guilty. When um, she was accused, she just seemed defensive, she seemed anxious, she seemed unempathetic, and she seemed angry. So I think I already mentioned this earlier, but I didn't mention that this was only discovered after Paulette's body was found that um, her parents had been lying the whole time. Lizette and Mariko did not help look for her body at all. They didn't even call the police. It was actually Mariko's um, sister, I believe it was, that called the police after hearing it from Mariko's brother. Just seemed like they were really disinterested in the whole thing and when the nannies told them that Paulette was missing, they just seemed, you know, kind of blase about it. They just, it just was just another day, it was another thing, like, they just seemed so unbothered by it, both of them. Most people in Mexico who knew of this case think that Lizette is guilty um, just because of the way that she was acting and just everything around this case, I feel like most things point to Lizette if foul play was involved. Lizette at one point actually tried to point the finger at her husband saying that he was guilty, which leads us to the next theory that Mariko is the one that killed Paulette. Some people even think that maybe Paulette was dead before they got back from their holiday. I'm not really sure how that would work. I'm, I don't know if they flew back from their holiday or if they drove. It wouldn't make sense if they flew if she was already dead, but some people think that it's possible that she was already dead before she got back from her holiday. Alberto Bazbaz, he was the attorney general for Mexico at the time of of Paulette's murder and it's said that it's possible that he covered it up 
for Mariko because they were close friends at the time so it is possible that you know Mariko's wealthy and they're friends and he's an attorney general so it is possible that he helped to cover up the case for him. Baz Baz was also adamant that Lizette had something to do with the matter he just a hundred percent thought that she killed Paulette and he was trying to point the finger at her the whole time. And I guess that seems like something that you would do if you're trying to cover up for someone is try and shift the blame from the person who is guilty to someone else to give reasonable doubt or to just shift the blame. But with that being said, it's not you know, the craziest thing in the world that he thought it was her because as I said previously, most people in Mexico thought that it was her. Another theory is that both of the parents were actually involved and that it was a staged kidnapping so that they could get some money because apparently they were having some financial struggles. They didn't know if they were going to be a able to afford the apartment that they were living in, afford the life that they were living. Um, they were having marital problems. As I said before, Lizette had, a, had an affair. Um, at the time of Paulette's disappearance. So the theory goes that um, maybe they staged a kidnapping so that they could extort money from Paulette's grandparents and from the government and the media and the people of Mexico. So the theory goes that maybe they staged the kidnapping so they could extort money from Paulette's grandparents, from the government, from the public, hence all of the interviews where they're asking for their daughter, pleading for their daughter and making it's such a big deal. I mean, of course they're making it a big deal. Of course, of course, of course. I'm not saying that, you know, what they're doing is wrong, but the theory goes that that is why they did so many interviews all of the time um, is so that they could get some money for her kidnapping. It's believed that maybe they hid Paulette in an air duct um, and they said, wait here, we'll come get you. And obviously, you know, she has these disabilities where she can't say anything and she can't walk. She needs help assistance walking. So they left her in there and they said, we'll come get you. But then the case just blew up and it got so huge that they couldn't get back to her in time and she suffocated before they managed to get back to her. So another thing in this theory I want to mention is I'm not sure how credible is this. I only saw this on one source. So the district attorney at the time of the disappearance was Alfredo Del Mazo Maza, I believe that it's pronounced, and he was friends with Lizette and her family. So basically some people believe that the investigation was just, you know, rigged from the start. It's strange that the um, house was apparently searched five times and nobody found anything. Nobody found her when she was in the house wedged at the foot of her bed and they searched it five times apparently. Another thing is apparently when investigators arrived at the scene, um, they did not, they were not allowed to look for anything other than forced entry. And pretty much as soon as they started looking, they were ordered to stop looking. So it's possible that the case was covered up by the district attorney because of the relationship with Lizette's family. I mean, there's so many inconsistencies in the case and in the search. Um, for Paulette's body that I definitely would not put it past a cover-up for this case. Another theory is that the nannies had something to do with it. This has little to no evidence at all. There's pretty much a theory for every single person in the family and that they did it and people who were in the household. There's a theory for all of them and one of them is that the nannies had something to do with it because they were the ones who were looking after the girls and they were the last ones to see her. Well, I mean, not the last ones to see her, but they were the ones who discovered that she was missing. They're also the ones who made the bed while Paulette was missing, but still at the foot of the bed. Another theory is that Paulette's sister um, accidentally killed her. They say that she was jealous of the attention that Paulette received because obviously she got more attention because she needed more attention because of her disabilities. Um, but some people think that maybe Lizette and Mariko were fighting on the night that they got back, the night that Paulette disappeared, which wouldn't be too far-fetched considering they were having marital problems. And um, some people think that maybe Paulette went into her sister's room and she was crying, she was scared, she was upset, and Paulette tried to shut her up and accidentally killed her in the process. And the last theory, of course, the official ruling of death is asphyxiation. So as I was looking into this case, I was pretty torn between this um, theory and the fact that it was a cover-up and that Lizette was the one who killed her own daughter. Just because of a lot of the evidence and the reconstructions that showed that you can, you know, make the bed without um, 
finding the body and there are people saying that the um, sheath that she was wrapped in actually prevented people from being able to smell the odor but I am definitely leaning more towards Lizette having killed her own daughter or someone having killed her like I feel like foul play was involved there's so much evidence that's missing there's so much things that like make it seem like this was or is a cover-up the forensics team said that she could only have been there for three days before they found her and said that they were most likely looking into a homicide case. I mean, the fact that nobody brought in, nobody thought to bring in any cadaver dogs considering they did with the Madeleine McCann case and she was just missing, she still is missing, and they still brought cadaver dogs in for that, so I feel like they should have brought cadaver dogs in for this case, and if they did, then it would have alerted them that she was either at the bed or she wasn't there because, you know, somebody killed her. You know, the whole scene was contaminated. So many things were just done wrong. Um, so many things about it are just really weird, which definitely makes it seem like a cover-up because there's just so many inconsistencies, so many just, I don't know, it's a really, like, stressful case. And if it's not a cover-up, then the police honestly did such a shitty job with this case. It's unbelievable. So that brings us to the end of this case. I really hope you guys enjoyed. I would love to hear your opinions in the comments down below. Make sure to give this one a thumbs up if you do enjoy these Mystery Mondays and want me to continue making them. And do leave down any evidence that I may have missed or anything that you know about the case that I didn't include in the video. Um, but I really hope you guys enjoyed and hopefully I will see you guys in my next video. Bye!